So um, I'm Beth McNally, and I'm going to talk to you about precision genetic medicine, because for me, the origins of much of what we talk about in precision medicine start with the fact that we're all genetically non-identical, unless you happen to have an identical twin. So assuming nobody's got an identical twin, we'll just start with that premise. Let's see if this is going to go. There we go. So first, um, just a little tour around the genome and, and what it really means. So the genome, you have a copy of your genome in every one of your cells, and the genome is a really big place. It's made up of three billion bases, which is A, C, G, and T, and about one to two percent of it actually specifies proteins, and there's about 20,000 genes. And so the part that makes protein is the one percent that makes protein is the part we understand best but these days, we've developed the technologies to be able to look at most all of it. So basic principle is that genes are spread out along the chromosome. They are made up of introns and exons. Exons are the part that actually make protein. Exons come together as transcription in messenger RNA, and then that becomes protein. And we just refer to that because that's the central dogma of what we do as, as geneticists. This is the life history of genetics, which you probably can't see in a lot of detail. But basically, um, you know, it began with Gregor Mendel and his peas, which I think everybody knows he kind of fudged the data just a little bit, but overall got the right idea. And it moved along fairly rapidly with the biggest changes really coming in the commitment to sequence the entire human genome, which happened a lot through the 1993 to about 2003 when we had the first human genome. So I like to look at genetics as being sort of before the human genome and after the human genome. And the world really changed dramatically because not only was this a worldwide effort to do the first human genome, but it really was an international collaboration and really drove the spirit of a lot of data sharing. So all of the data is freely available. It's available to every single person. Everything can be looked up. It's been in great databases. And so this has really, really propelled research in a huge way. So what really changed was our ability to do sequencing. So back when I was a graduate student, we did things like what is shown here, where we used to have these autoradiograms, and each one of these lines was a base. And if I had a good day, I could do about 700 base pairs of sequence. And remember, I told you it's 3 billion to make up a genome, so you can get that that's a lot of days. And then what changed is we started using fluorophores, and there was new technology to make us be able to do maybe thousands of base pairs in a day, but still not enough to be able to do a genome. And so the huge transformation really came in around 2005 when the idea came to actually stop doing it in gels and actually do it in an array-based format where millions of base pairs could be determined at the same time by using flow cell technologies. And so in doing that, you could get millions of base pairs. The trade-off is it's little short snippets of sequence that get determined at each time. And so when you do that, it actually ends up looking like this. And what this is, is an alignment of a short read. This is called short read sequencing. And a single base is then sequenced on average 30 or 40 times. And so each lane or each length of sequence is about 150 base pairs. And you try to cover it 30 times. So you get very quickly that to do this not only requires the technology to generate the sequence, but also the computational skills to be able to do that alignment to the three billion bases that make up the genome. So consequently, um, most of us who do genetics have gotten pretty good at thinking about hardware and software and how do we actually work with the computers to do this. And so this is where we are now, um, or all up to about 2011. There's been a whole series of different short read sequencers. The, the field, for those interested in the business end of it, has consolidated right now behind a company called Illumina that does a, a lot of the short read sequencers. But coming along right behind it is some combinations of longer read sequencing that aren't quite as accurate, but where we're moving is actually being able to integrate both short read and long read sequences. So what have we learned in doing that? Well, we learned that humans are all each much more different from each other than we ever previously imagined. And so what we started with was using an array-based format to look at about 
one one thousandth of the genome. So back when I was a graduate student, we thought it was a big deal if we looked at like a billionth of the genome at a time. Now we, we, there was a period where we could look at about one one thousandth. And this is the typical array technology if anybody's done 23andMe or Ancestry.com. That looks at about one one thousandth of your genome. And it's what we call high frequency variation. So that if I look at a single position, 30% of the people will have one thing, 70% will have another very high frequency variants in the population. And because these are high frequency variants, they don't have a huge effect on outcome because if they were very bad for you to have, very deleterious, they would be selected against. And if they were really good for you, we would see those really dominating within the population. So by and large, these high frequency variants, while they're interesting and they help us learn about ancestry and ethnicity, they don't really teach us very much. They don't give us as much in terms of a clinical effect. And that's different from what we call rare variation. And it turns out about 85% of the variation that makes up each of us is actually very rare. It's seen in less than 100, less than 500 people, less than 10,000 people, really, really rare genetic variants. And so if it happens to fall in a gene that can cause a fairly devastating clinical outcome, we'll see that gene running in families causing diseases like what I take care of, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or causing, for example, certain forms of breast cancer with BRCA1 mutations. So these rare variants, most most of our variation is rare. Some of them cause disease, and some of them don't really do very much at all. But when you identify them, it's very powerful information for the families that carry that. And that's where a lot of our genetic testing is right these days. So the genetic reality is, is when we look at each of our full genomes, we're a mix of these high frequency variants. Again, that's about 15% of the variation and 85% of our variation is actually rare variation. And so when I compare any two individuals, they're a lot more different than we ever would have really thought. So genetic testing is really a big part of what we do in practice right now for these what we consider rare diseases, but it turns out, again, it's affecting even more common problems. So I do, I'm a cardiologist. We do this now for heart failure and rhythm problems breast cancer, colon cancer, and other familial cancers. There is mainstay genetic testing for that, hypercholesterolemia, and then certain neurological and neuromuscular diseases. If you go have some one of these diseases run in your family, they will do a deep sequencing test to actually figure out what the genetic mutation is. But interpreting genetic variation from person to person is not so easy to do. So this is what the, a genetic code looks like. It works in these three, three base pairs, specify one amino acid residue, ATG means a methionine. And so they all, every three base pairs makes a, makes a different amino acid. Some of the mutations are much easier to interpret. We'll actually see something where all of a sudden this becomes a new stop sign just got put right in the middle of the gene. Well, we know that's pretty bad for a gene and usually bad for a person. Those are pretty easy to interpret. And similarly, if you insert and all of a sudden it starts reading out of code, we know that that's pretty easy to interpret. So insertions, deletions, and stop signs are easy to interpret. But the majority of our variation is much more like this. It just changed one amino acid to another. And there's a lot of that that's very benign. And there's some of that that's actually pathologic. And that's where we actually spend a lot of our time these days trying to determine that when we interpret a genetic test. And so we've gotten to the point where we know some of those variants are disease causing and others are benign. And the biggest determinant whether something's benign is whether it's high frequency in the population. So how you hear me referring to genetic testing in populations, what does that mean? Well, the first really landmark project of these was now about six years ago, which was called the Thousand Genomes Project. And for the first time, a thousand people were sequenced. So remember, right around 2003 is when we finished the first genome. That cost $3 billion, and it took about 10 years to do. And just a few, you know, less than 10 years after that, we were in the position of being able to have a thousand genomes. And now there are databases where there are 200,000 genomes. And so, we can get a much greater sense of what that genetic variation looks like when we look across populations. And so one of the, the uh, biobanks that we have, a biobank is when you actually donate a DNA sample and hopefully some of your clinical information. We have had the New Gene Biobank here at, at, at Northwestern for a number of years, and we've now collected about 15,000 samples as part of that, and those are 15,000 people who get their care here at Northwestern and who've agreed to be part of this really important research that's helping us understand how genetic variation causes diseases. 
And so um, we're also part of a consortium known as eMERGE, which is a way we're actually taking all the big data that's in electronic medical health records alongside genetic information, and we're learning how to merge those things together so that we can learn more about how genetic variation causes certain types of diseases, and Northwestern has been part of eMERGE for a number of years. Um, this is actually a first quick sampling of our first 900 whole genomes that we've done here at Northwestern, where we just started to look at what is the racial ethnic distribution of these. And what you can see is that individuals who identify themselves as Hispanic are shown in green, and they are less genetically related to each other than people who identify themselves as Caucasian. They're just this clump of blue dots because people who are Caucasian or of European background are much more genetically related to each other. On the other hand, people who identify as African ancestry, they are also more different from each other. And so again, you see that different groups represent different ethnicities. And what we want to be able to move towards is actually using better genetic markers to predict disease rather than somebody's ethnicity because ethnicities are very diverse. So um, hopefully you saw sitting outside is what's called All of Us. All of Us is the precision medicine initiative that began now about two years ago. It kicked off the grant off. Uh, and this is a nationwide effort to actually collect a million people to have genetic and clinical information on it. And some people have said, well, why would I want to do something like that? And the reason why is because this is the equivalent to like landing on the moon. Landing on the moon was a big deal because of what it taught us about science. And this is everyday people's opportunity to be like that astronaut and landing on the moon and helping us really move forward in understanding how genetic variation can actually cause different phenotypes. We can't do this unless we have a lot of people participating in it. And so we were very lucky here at Northwestern because we had done this already in the form of eMERGE. We were actually among the first site accepted to be part of the precision medicine initiative, which again is a national effort. So the consortium in Illinois, which is led by Northwestern, includes four different institutions in Illinois, and we're just now getting to the phase where we're having people sign up for this. And so there's a, a whole a many, many layers of privacy protections associated with this. Actually, the single most important thing is to make sure people's privacy is protected, but then to also create an, a useful database that's going to help us interpret genetic information. So this is just some of the missions of um, all of us. They're going to, this is going to be really exciting to participate in because those who participate are also going to have very unique access to the data themselves as well. And so those of, those of you who want to, you know, really participate in science firsthand, this is your shot to do it. So what about, so I talked a lot about doing genetic sequencing for people who have diseases or diseases that run in their family. But what about for people who don't have a disease? Is it worth getting your genome done? Do you want to get your genome sequenced? And so right now, there's about 60 genes, 59, that have been identified as actionable genes. So if we do genome sequencing on someone, we can automatically first look at these 59 actionable genes. And if we find a mutation in those genes, we have clear ways in which we make medical recommendations to reduce risk. So genetics is all about identifying risks and then using that information to reduce risk. And so this is actually available for healthy people, and about 2 to 3 percent of the population will actually have something found that's going to change the way we recommend how their health care is managed. So it's a real opportunity. Um, some of you, did anybody in this ever do Ancestry.com or 23andMe? Anybody here? So this is from Ancestry. I stole it off their web page today. They were running this special test for St. Patrick's Day for anybody who really wanted to know if they were Irish or not for we all, but we're all Irish, so it's okay. So, um, And then this is 23andMe. So these are two different services that many people have participated in. Um, 23andMe also will give you a few variants that do have to do with clinical outcomes, so you can sign up for their Ancestry ancestry part, or you can actually sign up for the part that gives you a little bit of clinical information. And anybody who's done it knows that there's a website and you can log in and get information yourself. And so what we're seeing with all of this genetics, both with, with all of us, with eMERGE now, with these commercial entities, is that we really want to engage those who contribute and participate. You're just as much part of this process as we as the scientists and clinicians are. And so that's why you get logins and you get access to the data. And it really is changing the way we manage the genetic information and engage with the people who choose to participate. So how does genetic information help us? Well, for those who have genetic disorders, it gives us a diagnosis. 
Really importantly, it gives a genetic diagnosis for their family members, which is how we use it in cardiology a lot. We can identify somebody who has a disease. We know there's now risk to some, but not all of their family members, and we can reduce their risk. And it also allows for reproductive choices. And most importantly, why a, a lot of pharmaceutical companies are interested in it, it identifies new paths for developing medicines. And so just a, a quick word about reproductive considerations. I take care of a lot of young people who have genetic disorders, and some of them have not wanted to have their own children because they were so afraid about passing on their genetic disease to their children. And that's a very serious concern, and I completely understand it. So what's exciting for us now is we can offer them something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where egg and sperm come together and divide into a few cells, and you can peel off a couple of those cells and actually do a genetic diagnosis, and then only implant the eggs that don't have the mutation. And we've now done this with many, many of our, our families who want to have their own children, and it's been very successful. Um, and what's really great about it is we've actually had an insurance cover it now in the last few years. So we've had a number of people who've been able to have their own children. And this is actually what it looks like when they peel off the egg. It's amazing that this can be done. Um, so we're also in the era where we're looking at genetic correction as therapy. We know about pharmacogenomics, where we use different drugs based on people's genetic composition. We are seeing drugs being developed to actually treat specific mutations called antisense or stop codon ther therapies. But I think what many of us have our eye on right now is what's called genetic editing or, or genetic correction. Some of you have heard of this. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. It was a remarkable discovery that was first put in the literature in just 2012 and 2013 in mammalian cells. And so in just five short years, we we're actually seeing this remarkable change of not only being able to diagnose genetic diseases, but thinking about how soon we're going to get this into the clinic where we can actually change people's genomic con composition and treat their genetic disease. And so this was one of the very first reports of this. This actually came out from a Chinese group where they did it in a fertilized egg. It created a lot of consternation among the scientists community because there are many ethical questions associated with changing the genetic composition in this way. Um, and then just recently in this last year, there was um, another a, a, a attempt at doing this quite successfully, and it was done on a, a gene which is called MYBPC3, which is a gene we work with all the time because it's a gene that causes heart disease. And so it's very clear that the capabilities of doing this are really evolving very, very quickly. And so this is just the last couple slides to show you how related are we to other organisms. We're about 92% related to mice. We use a lot of mice in, in our testing, and that's an important thing to know. We're about 99% related to chimpanzees, which is also really important. And then we ourselves are all about 99.9% .9 related to each other. And so, um, oh, and just not to forget about this, some of that that makes us all different from each other is some of the humanoid type things that work their way into our genomes over many thousands of years, and that includes that there is Neanderthal DNA, which I think you can get off the 23andMe now, they're getting to that point. And just with the last slide is to realize that the Genome Project is not exclusively limited to humans. Um, the Dog Genome Project is incredibly fascinating because when you think about what's happened with dogs, first of all, they have relatively short lifespans. We as humans have done all this amazing breeding with dogs so that they have really, really cool traits to try to map. Imagine getting the retriever gene, like wouldn't that be great to know what it is? But what's fascinating is that dogs are actually much, much more related to each other than humans are, and that's because of the nature of how they've been bred. So the Dog Genome Project is already yielding a lot of very interesting fruit, and I'm curious, has anybody sent off their dog for genetic testing? I know my sister did it, and it came back and told her that she had a Doberman when she clearly didn't have a Doberman. So, um, <laughs> so that's part of the problem, which is the markers for the dog genomes are getting better, and so sequencing will be the way to get to the dog genomes. And so with that, I will stop and, and yield the floor to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Dr. McNally. Um, just just a, a quick reminder, after our presenters finish up with their presentations, we'll ask them to join a panel. Uh, we'll have some prepared Q&A and open up um, for audience Q&A after that. 
Um, so with that said, our next presenter is Dr. Thomas Shanley. Dr. Thomas Shanley is a chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Ann and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago. Um, he is the chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He also serves as the president and chief research officer of the Stanley Mann Children's Research Institute. Dr. Shanley is an internationally renowned physician leader and researcher in pediatric critical care. As a clinician, he specializes in the treatment of children with hypoxemic respiratory failure from lung disease and septic shock triggered by infection. Over the course of his career, he has conducted basic, translational, and clinical research and has a keen interest in making the translational spectrum more efficient so that benefits reach patients quicker. Dr. Shanley currently is the principal investigator on six National Institute of Health um, sponsored projects. He has authored over 100 peer reviewed publications and he sits on the steering committee of the NIH Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Um, and today, Dr. Shanley is going to talk to us about um, various applications of precision medicine to pediatrics. Well, thank you all, and uh, thank you to C2ST for the invitation to participate in this uh, presentation to this evening. And uh, Beth did a really great job uh, introducing you to the genomic component of precision medicine. I'm going to dovetail right into that and talk a little bit about applications of that, and then also talk about some additional technologies that can also affect how we provide precise tailored therapy uh, to children and patients. So the outline is here. I'm going to talk about how the approach, uh, a precision medicine approach can impact clinical management by demonstrating how DNA sequencing alters, for example, pediatric epilepsy care. And what we then do, Beth mentioned uh, mutations, when we don't know whether they cause a disease or not, what we're doing with those. I want to then highlight the promise and challenges of other emerging technologies that can be um, leveraged for personalized care. I'm going to use an example of 3D printing and, and talk uh, building upon the fertility uh, present preservation aspect that uh, Beth introduced, as well as DNA editing potential in that application, as well as just touch briefly on wearables and what I believe wearables will provide in the future as additional sources of personalized data. And then finally, I want to dovetail into how patient-specific biomarkers can be used to better predict not just outcomes, but actually enhance clinical trial designs and describe advances uh, that I believe are necessary to facilitate that in some technology uh, for determining real-time biomarkers. And I think that'll set up uh, the last speaker. So first of all, uh, we, we have initiated a precision medicine initiative at Lurie Children's, and I highlight there in red what it really aims to do, and that's combining advances in what we describe as omic uh, biology technology and data analytics. And omic refers uh, to all those things that Beth describes. So the DNA is the genomic, the RNA is the transcriptomic, the protein is the proteomic, meta metabolomics, et cetera. So you can imagine these broad arrays of data that come out of each of these biospecies that affect what the human, uh, how the human responds in diseases and health. Um, and we hope that uh, doing so will allow us to identify specific and optimal therapies for each child to improve their outcomes. So really what we're talking about, so much of our therapies have been viewed as just throwing a very big bomb uh, or even a shotgun blast at what really we know could be a very specific laser-focused target. And that's really the concept of what we hope to achieve in precision medicine. And so as we work in a clinical realm, we know historically there's been a, a lab uh, work that's come out of clinical laboratories as we send blood tests off. We uh, collect a bunch of clinical information. Remember, it wasn't that long ago. All that clinical information was in handwritten notes. And so the emergence of the electronic health record to actually allow us to code data and search data more effectively has been a major step forward, as well as other radiology and other 
uh, I think, to be determined collections of physiologic data uh, that will advance. And as in the period Beth mentioned about how I, we used to do those um, sequencing uh, screens, uh, the explosion that we've now had in the amount of lab and clinical data and radiologic and other data that happens is so much now that an individual pay, uh, physician and even the team really can't effectively distill down that information. And so it requires us to really build some extraordinary platforms to handle the lab data and handle this explosion of clinical and radiologic data in a manner that facilitates data analytics. So that key platform that will ultimately aggregate all these data in an effective way to lead us towards an improved clinical decision is what we hope to do. So again, here are the omics. Beth mentioned the genomics. And there are also DNA that regulate how our body responds to and metabolizes drugs specifically. So we describe those genes as pharmacogenomics. Uh, and again, they end up producing the proteins. These are really the workers of the body in terms of what regulates our responses, and we call that entire group proteomics. And when we think about how the body uses things like carbohydrates or sugars, how it uses proteins, and how it uses fats, and what it then produces both in terms of energy as well as maladaptive responses, we can also track the response of those metabolic pathways and look at what's kind of spit out by the body. And those give us a metabolomic profile that enables us to dif differentiate between health and disease. So you can imagine the amount of data that's collected here. And what we hope this allows us to do is really exemplified here. It doesn't matter what disease process you take, we could call this acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children, for example. That typically looks the same. We call it the same, and we start therapies in the old days away. And we may get that cohort that we aim to achieve, which is those patients in which the drug is neither toxic, or it's not toxic, but it's also beneficial. The patient has a pharmacologic response to that drug. Unfortunately, embedded within this population, are all these other patients in which either the drug is not beneficial at all, or the drug happens to be beneficial, but it's very toxic, or in some cases where it's neither beneficial nor toxic. And so the concept of precision medicine is trying to look at prediction and understanding what it is about the genomic build, the makeup of that patient that allows us to better predict the patients that will end up in that green box where we want them to, to move. So again, Beth highlighted the challenge, one of the major challenges that I see is how we deal with these massive amounts of information that we have. And so once the sequencing is done and the evaluation is done, we aim to try to manage the treatment in a rational way. Now, uh, we've taken a, an approach in terms of the sequencing platform that was described of building a couple disease-focused verticals out of that. And the two verticals that we've chosen initially have been to focus on epilepsy and focus on oncology. And part of the process in terms of selecting those is related a little bit more to the discovery piece of those rather than the sequencing importance of that aspect. So I don't want to do a commercial here, but I, if this works out, I wanted to try to describe uh, or have this family describe the potential power here and talk about how we get to this situation. Let's see, if it's not a, it did work a little while ago. Oh, it might not have the right flash player. Well, okay, so anyway, so that was a, a two minute video on Amelia's story. And the story, Amelia's story was that at five weeks of age, her family started noticing or making abnormal movements and, and abnormal sounds. And when she went to the pediatrician, it, she was diagnosed with the onset of epilepsy. She was at another center, uh, and they started a drug uh, while she was in the hospital to try to control the seizure. She continued to have breakthrough seizures from that. They started at five times a day. Uh, by the time a week in the hospital, now on four separate drugs, she was having 25 seizures a day. And they finally said, that's probably out of our hand, uh, out of our expertise and capability. And so she was referred down to our neurology team in epilepsy. And that was our initial medical contact with her, where her seizure was diagnosed in cephalop uh, with uh, EEG, the, the monitoring on the brain to look at brainwave tracings. And we started, this was her initial treatment that she started with us. 
or with the outside hospital. When she got to us and the genomics were uh, uh, obtained, we go through what I, we describe as a tier. So if you remember the slide that Dr. McNally showed, there are disease-causing mutations that are known. We now have the capability of putting them on a chip or a panel to be able to diagnose those immediately. So if one of the 79 genes that are associated with epilepsy are discovered, we then know that there's primary drugs that are most effective at that gene mutation. And that's what happened in the case of Amelia. She had a known mutation in a potassium channel, and the drug that best targets that, she wasn't on. As soon as she was started on that drug, her seizures stopped. She was having no further seizures. Her neurodevelopmental milestones picked back up. And so really, her outcome was completely transformed for this family who thought they were gonna have a devastated child. So that's really the first tier in terms of making a diagnosis from a known genetic cause. Dr. McNally then mentioned the second tier that we go to, and that's all the changes that are potential in the genes that form those proteins. We collectively, you'll hear this often referred to the exome, the whole exome, the protein um, sequence part of our genome. And then, as she um, stated, you can end up doing the whole thing and looking for all disease-causing mutations from that standpoint. So what we do, once that's uh, a mutation may not be known, if it's known, we can make the changes. If it's not known, now how do we get to her? How do we understand how this mutation is causing it? So we're able these days to take a gene mutation and we can put it in a cell and we can look at the neurophysiologic response of the cell. We can put it in a mouse and even collaborators that we have in Boston can put it in a zebrafish. And you can actually tell when a zebrafish might be seizing because you've introduced a mutation to them. But when you think about treating a cell or a fish or a mouse, instead of treating a kid to practice or, or try to try what drugs may work, you understand the power of taking these mutations into models that we can then do high throughput with. Now, the other opportunity that hasn't been mentioned yet is these pluripotent stem cells. So all of us right now have in our bloodstream circulating cells that if we take them out of you, we can virtually turn them into any type of cell that we want. So in Amelia's case, we also took her pluripotent stem cells and turned them in a test tube into nerve cells where they would be functioning abnormally like her seizures were caused by her abnormal cells. We then have a terrific collaborator, Al George, who's our chair of pharmacology, who has a high throughput way of putting those cells in a test tube essentially and testing thousands of anti-seizure drugs to see do we find the drug that's the right target for that particular mutation and we can reintroduce that in the kid, okay? So that's where the power of the DNA and understanding that can really transform how we care for pediatric diseases. And there's many applications that we can talk about. So I'm gonna switch now out of the DNA a little bit and focus on the other emerging technologies such as 3D printing and DNA editing. Uh, so I, I hearken back to this concept of how we try to think about fertility and uh, hormonal preservation. So we have a program, a center of excellence in this. It's built off of the Oncofertility program that Dr. Woodruff has established here at Feinberg. And what we aim to do is establish a translationally spanning. That means going all the way from basic science work all the way out into the bedside and with uh, clinical implications. And really to facilitate, our vision is that we'll facilitate the first infant among many who's born to an individual whose fertility was preserved before they went through puberty. Okay? And we, uh, we have some uh, reasons in terms of oncology and, but other disease processes. So what do I mean from that standpoint? Well, if you think about children that come to Lurie or any other children's hospital with an oncology or cancer, and in this case we have, for example, this young girl uh, who has these large tumors uh, that are diagnosed as Ewing sarcoma, a tumor of the bone. She's going to, if you look at the location of where these tumors are, she's going to have to go through significant chemotherapy and significant radiation therapy, and her ovaries will be destroyed if we don't do something first. So she has no chance of ever having a child uh, 20 years ago, five years ago, perhaps. So what we aim to do is set up a program where we're able to go in and collect her ovaries before she gets exposed to any of these gonadotoxic therapies. 
And once we uh, collect and appropriately store that, and then we let her go through therapy and we let her grow up, we let her go through puberty, what we aim to do then is recreate essentially what we call an ovarian bioprosthesis, using the ovary as an organ transplant back into her. So how could we possibly be doing this in this day and age? And so I won't go into great details about this, but I'll show you the picture in a second. We have the ovarian tissue that's cryobanked. We have to somehow create a scaffold that looks like an ovary we have to work on stem cell biology to differentiate cells into those kinds of cells that support the development of an oocyte, and then we need to get that egg, that young girl's egg, back into that scaffold as well. So I show this as an example of using these types of approaches, and this is what the, the scaffold looks like. So this is a very biocompatible uh, collagen-based scaffold. And what we would do is embed this with the granulosa cells that support the hormones to support the follicular development of the oocytes into an egg that can be then fertilized by the sperm. Now, uh, this is what um, this typically looks like. And the reason I pulled this out is to build on Dr. McNally's discussion of CRISPR-Cas. So you can also imagine that if you had a mother, for example, who had cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease and wanted to have an unaffected child, you could pull her oocytes out, do the CRISPR-Cas removal and correction of the affected gene, and then put it back in with this machinery, with this ovarian bioprosthesis. Now, I don't want to sound like Frankenstein here, but if you don't think that's where the future is going, you're, you're predicting the wrong thing. There's certainly, as Beth mentioned, a ton of bioethics around this, but we just feel like this is important that we understand how to do this so that when the time comes for DNA editing, we'll be well positioned to help mothers be able to have unaffected biological children from that standpoint. And this is a significant proof of principle of how you can manipulate the DNA specifically. So in this experiment led by Monica LaRonda, who runs the basic science for the Center of Excellence, she actually did DNA editing by putting a green fluorescent tag into the embryos, into the egg's DNA, so that if there was an, a native, uh, one of the ovaries was native pup, that would be unaffected, but if there was a pup born from that bio, ovarian bioprosthesis, they would be glowing green. So this is a small animal model of being able to establish this for a proof of principle. And we're now moving this both into larger animals and ultimately into human technology so we understand how to do this effectively even before we think about the DNA editing ramifications of that. So uh, the additional, uh, another technology that we see emerging and I would highly recommend if you haven't had an opportunity to, to have uh, Dr. Rogers, who's a, a mechanical engineer uh, on North, at Northwestern, are what we're doing with wearables in this point in time. And so this is a design uh, of how you can put this on your skin. Uh, this is the kind of stretching that can occur and, this, and the twisting that can occur with this device. And what it's able to do is pick up, uh, that's what it looks like when it's on you, and you're able to pick up your heart rate. So when you listen to John give a talk, he undoes his shirt, I don't have mine on tonight, and he'll show you his little wearable and he'll show you his phone with his EKG. And so this is just one way, think about the power of that. We could send kids home with heart disease and have them have a wearable where their information is being downloaded in a continuous manner. So wearables are certainly gonna transform how we manage care outside of the walls of our traditional medical centers. And I wanna also highlight an additional component of it where accelerometry, so movement can be tracked, Temperature can be tracked, and in the future, he's building a process. This is what that one looks like. And he's also building a process where being able to get fluid absorbed within these and using a technology that I'll introduce in a second, LSPR, allows you to measure biomarkers even. So we can add physiologic data with biomarker data coming out of secreted fluid from patients that they're wearing at home and transmitting through Bluetooth-enabled activities. So this is another source of technology that I think will continue to drive personalized medicine from that standpoint. And the last highlight that I wanted to then give was show how patient-specific biomarkers can use to predict outcomes and enhance trial design uh, and how we um, move forward. So a, a, a quick story here from the standpoint of um, pediatric sepsis and septic shock. 
uh, we looked at one of those omics. We looked at all the genes that were expressed between children who were normal and children who died from septic shock. And this is what that, all that data looks like from that standpoint. But the interesting thing is you can sort of see three classes there, right? Just by color, all you have to do is just say, boy, those groups look different. And it turns out that as we went through the process, that of all those genes, there were five that looked really important because they were expressed so differently between those children that died and those that survived. This just happens to be the list of those. But why I think it's important is that the CART analysis, which is just a biostatistical methodology, allows you to make some very important predictions when you measure just five of these, okay? So this is one of the nodes. When you look at um, a measure of the interleukin-8 level, when it's low, you can see only two patients of 133 die. When this elastase number is high, nobody dies. And when this NGAL number is low, nobody dies. So if you combine those three factors into what we call a low-risk terminal node, these are kids with, that are in the ICU with sepsis. But if they have that characteristic panel, only 1% of them dies. That's less than the normal mortality rate in all the ICU. It's usually 2.4. Of all kids that walk into an ICU, 2.4% die. So this is, this is normal. These are normal kids. In, in, on the other hand, you look at this high-risk node. So if this number is elevated, 11 of 25 die, this number, 6 of 14 die, and this number, 4 of 10. That's a different story, okay? Usually only 10% of kids with sepsis die. Here's a, bio, a set of three biomarkers that tells me that kid has got a 43% chance of dying. That's four to five times the normal rate. That's a kid you want to put in a fancy immune modulating therapeutic trial, not the other kid who's not going to die no matter what you do to him. He's only or she's only going to dilute out your signal of seeing a beneficial effect of a new therapy. So this is why this approach can actually help you begin to design their uh, trials much better. Now, the challenge is, how do you get that information? Right? And I think that's, would be the, that's the next step here in terms of technology. So I don't have time to go through it, uh, and, it's, and I don't really understand it either. It's really fancy engineering <laughs> stuff. But localized surface plasma and resonance, what I will tell you is that you can, what you can do is you can put these gold particles and you can, you can build antibodies or um, captures to anything that you're interested in measuring, literally anything you're interested in measuring. And when that does bind, when something binds to that, you do get a spectral shift. And you can do this either electrically or with optics. And so um, that's, that's what they're embedding in these sensors, is that you can get um, electrical changes from that standpoint. This is what the chip that you make these for. So you can see that this, is just a, this isn't even a drop of blood. This is less than a drop of blood. So you can do this over and over and over again in babies, serially, without taking too much blood from them. And the most important message, I think, is this, is that when you look at the determination of a signal, these are biomolecules that we think are important in this response, and you look at when the time is up that you have a signal that's measurable in 30 minutes now. So now from very little blood, in 30 minutes at the bedside, you can get a biomarker determined. So I could get a kid that walks into the ICU now, I could do my panel of six biomarkers and tell you, yes, put them in a clinical trial or don't put them in a clinical trial. So I think this is another, in addition to, to being able to do personalized and precision medicine from things that you might be interested in measuring in your particular diseases, this kind of technology that gives us near real-time determination is gonna really transform, I think, personalized tailored approaches from that standpoint. Um, in addition, I won't go there, but we, we can also, these are biomarkers, but we can also start to isolate and test, stimulate each of the immune cells in our bloodstream to look at how they're responsive in terms of either immunosuppressive therapies or just normal responses as well. Um, so also I think this technology, which uses then the LSPR readout, is going to allow us to functionally tailor medicine from the immunosuppression standpoint overall. So I think that's going to be a, a, a real advance in what we do in terms of monitoring kids with immunosuppressive therapies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shanley, for the most enlightening presentation. Uh, there's a lot to digest there. And our next presenter is Dr. James Sullivan. 
um, who is the Vice President for Discovery at AbbVie, which is the largest pharmaceutical company in the Chicago area. Um, in, in this role, he's responsible for AbbVie's research efforts in the variety of diseases that include cancer, Alzheimer's disease, hepatitis C, and a number of autoimmune disorders. He, um, Dr. Sullivan now oversees a global network of scientists that includes AbbVie researchers at sites in the United States and Europe and external research, research partners around the world. Dr. Sullivan has advanced more than 100 compounds into clinical development. Uh, he has authored or co-authored over 130 scientific publications and also is an inventor on 11 patents. Dr. Salman is an adjunct faculty member at Northwestern University, and he serves on a number of boards for private uh, companies and foundations. Um, and today, Dr. Salman is going to talk to us about um, the research that's being done at Abbey around precision medicine. Thank you, Paulina, and good evening, everyone. And I'd like to also express my thanks to Alan and C2ST for uh, the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about personalized medicine and, and some of the work uh, we and, and, and industry is doing to take advantage of some of the great advances you've heard Beth and Tom talk about. So I've got the uh, great honor of leading a team of scientists at AbbVie. Uh, and as we seek to discover and deliver to patients transformative medicines, you know, there are a number of questions that we, not just at AbbVie, but across industry and, and colleagues at Northwestern also share. You know, why do some people get diseases and others not? Why do treatments work for some individuals, but not for many others? And then how can we or I find a transform transformational medicine living with some of these diseases? Now, hopefully over the last 45 minutes, you've come to appreciate that genomics can help us all answer these, these three important questions. And as we think about the power of genomics and, and the fast array of approaches that Beth and Tom described, you know, we believe that this can help all facets of our healthcare system across, across the globe, benefiting patients, physicians, and payers in terms of how we prevent disease, how we diagnose disease, how we come up with more tailored, effective therapeutics for individual patients, how we come up with new medicines. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, tonight. So as Beth mentioned, after a 13-year odyssey and over $2.7 billion, the sequence of the first human genome was completed in 2003. That was a remarkable scientific accomplishment. But today, a mere 15 years later, we have over a million human genomes that have been sequenced. And that number of complete sequences is going up rapidly every single year. And we heard tonight about 23andMe and Ancestry.com, how for you know, a fraction of this cost, a very, very tiny fraction of this cost, you can actually get your own DNA uh, sequenced or, or partially sequenced. So the advent of uh, gen genetics and genomics has really enabled us in industry to really rethink the way we better uh, identify what's triggering a variety of diseases, understand what proteins are important in causing a range of diseases, once we understand that better, we are in a much better position to come up with medicines, biologics, or small molecules, pills that you can take or you inject, that can be far more effective. And when we do that, using some of the biomarker techniques that Tom described and, and many others, we can then ensure that those patients who are most likely to respond to our, our, our next generation medicine uh, are getting that medicine and not people who are unlikely to respond. So let me bring that to life with a couple of examples of where genomics is playing an important role in our research. Alzheimer's disease is absolutely a looming tsunami for the healthcare system. If we do not come up with a more effective therapeutic for dementia and particularly Alzheimer's disease, we could have over 100 million people with dementia, 
by 2050. And the economic costs of that are just going to be staggering. Alzheimer's disease is not a disease that impacts one person. It also significantly impacts the caregiver. When you look at the, you know, the top 10 uh, diseases in the United States, Alzheimer's disease is the only one today that cannot be slowed, prevented, or cured. And I know that's depressing news for all of us, but uh, that is why there's a tremendous need to come up with new, uh, new therapeutic approaches. We all know that aging is a, a significant risk factor for, for Alzheimer's and other dementias. But this is where human genetics and genomic analysis has provided new insights that offers hope that we may be on the cusp of coming forward with new transformative causes. For the last 20 years, the vast majority of research into Alzheimer's disease has been focused on one pathologic protein in our brains, a protein called amyloid. It's a sticky protein, it's accumulated outside of neurons, and ultimately causes degeneration. And many companies have investigated therapies aimed at blocking the formation of amyloid and or removing amyloid once it's formed. Now, patients typically show up for this therapy, for this opportunity, when they have cognitive symptoms. The problem has been that amyloid starts to accumulate in all of our brains when we're 20, 30, 40 years of age, well before we have any cognitive symptoms. So by giving these therapies late on in disease, it is frankly too late. And so one needs to move much earlier with that particular approach. Now, human genetics, over the course of the last 15 years, has revealed other ways in which we might be able to attack Alzheimer's disease. Many of us are familiar with the advances uh, in immuno-oncology. In other words, harnessing our immune system to attack and kill cancer cells. If one looks at human genetics of, of patients with Alzheimer's disease, we're uncovering that there are aspects of the immune system in our brains that are altered in Alzheimer's disease. For example, this protein up here called TREM2, it's, it's, on, a, uh, it's on a particular immune cell in the, in the brain called a microglia. Microglia are there to scavenge up toxic proteins. We now know that if, if people with uh, mutations in TREM2 are at an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So what we and many others hope is that by harnessing the immune system in our brains, we will be able to do for Alzheimer's disease what, um, uh, where, where, what the immune system is doing for many types of cancer today. And there are a variety of other approaches uh, from this whole the genetic sequencing that Pat and Tom described, where you sequence the entire genomes or you sequence part of the genomes and you can get insights into different pathways and approaches that we will use to, to go start down the drug discovery process to come up with new therapeutics. It's not just Alzheimer's where genomics is having a significant impact, but also in, in other diseases, again, that Tom and Beth mentioned. Over the course of the last 15 years, we've come up with genetic tests that can give patients with cancer uh, a sense of increased risk for cancer. Historically, I think we're all aware that cancer has been diagnosed based on tissue. You've breast cancer, you've lung cancer, you've colorectal cancer. Now with human genetics and the tools of, of genomics, we're in a position where we're able to better understand what mutations within a particular tumor uh, are, are occurring in a patient. And that's allowing us to discover more targeted therapies. For patients with, with leukemia, uh, there's a new class of agents called BCL2 inhibitors that have proven to be very effective in those patients who harbor mutations uh, related to BCL2. Rare diseases is a second area where, there's, where the power of human genetics is having a very significant impact. If you were a, a, a patient or had a loved one who was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis 
or who was born with cystic fibrosis in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the chances that that individual would live to 30 years of age were close to zero. We now know that one of the key drivers for cystic fibrosis is a protein called CFTR. And that mutations in that protein are triggering the disease. And so we at AbbVie and, and, and other companies are seeking to develop therapies that will fix that, that uh, mutation and allow that protein to uh, exist and, and act normally within a cell. Cardiovascular disease has also seen significant advances in terms of the use of or genomics to identify new targets for high, high cholesterol. Many of you may know, so now with human genomics, we have a sense of, okay, new approaches that we can take for Alzheimer's disease, for cancer, for cystic fibrosis, for cardiovascular disease. Historically, in our industry, most of the ideas that we have in our labs, when we evaluate those ideas in clinical studies, they fail. The vast majority of our ideas have not played out. What we, what we and others have found over the last decade is if we focus our research on those ideas where there is some link to human, with, from human genetics, that those ideas have a higher probability of success in clinical studies. This is data from, uh, a, from a company, as, uh, not AbbVie, from a second company, where in phase two, which is the mid-stage of clinical development. There are three stages of, of clinical development. Phase one is where you test a new agent in healthy volunteers. Phase two, in a small number of patients to establish continued safety and hopefully efficacy. And phase three, in a much larger uh, group of patients. In phase two clinical development, those programs where there was uh, linkage to the disease through human genetics had a much higher success rate. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we can work on better ideas, we're going to be in a position to accelerate the advancement of innovative treatments to patients. We will be able to get those treatments out there much quicker, and hopefully much quicker than the 15 to 20 years that it typically takes. So at AbbVie, uh, we have, you know, we're tremendously excited by the power of human genetics and, and omics technologies in general. And we've set up a number of collaborations across the globe to, to leverage the power of human genomics. We have collaborations in Finland that allows us to access the sequences of 500,000 people. In the United Kingdom, which allow a uh, collaboration to access 250,000 patients as part of uh, the UK Biobank. And last year, we entered into a collaboration in Ireland uh, with a company called Genetics Medicine Ireland. Ireland is a, has a very homogeneous population, which offers advantages in terms of doing genetic test or uh, sequencing of, of human genomes and then linkage, finding linkages to disease. And so we are, we are in the process of sequencing 45,000 uh, sequ uh, patient DNA or genomes in Ireland across a number of disease states. And we will link that with phenotypic data. So we will have their electronic medical records and we will have their genetic data. It will be anonymized to us, uh, but we will vote those sets of data. And in so doing, it offers us the opportunity to come up with yet again new approaches to, to cancer, to multiple sclerosis, to Alzheimer's disease. So after listening to Beth, Tom, and, and myself, you may, be, you may think that, oh my gosh, have we, have we cracked the code here? Have we, are we gonna be able to solve all diseases with all these advances that we've talked about over the last 45 to 50 minutes? The answer is, uh, we're not even close. We're, this is the tip of the proverbi proverbial uh, iceberg. Uh, over the course of the next decade, many of the techniques that Bet and Tom and many of the techniques we're using will be enhanced further. Uh, we will come up with better biomarkers. We will come up with new technologies, improvements upon the gene editing technologies that were described here tonight. 
But what is encouraging is that it, these advances that have occurred over the last 15 years have provided remarkable insights into human health and human disease and have catalyzed the discovery and advancement to patients of transformative medicine. But as John Kennedy said at Rice University in 1962, the greater our knowledge increases, the, the greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. And it's really important that we're humble in terms of what we do not know, uh, but continue to, to, to capitalize on the advances that have been made. So to conclude, and maybe to tie together all of the presentations from this evening, you know, hopefully one day in the not too distant future, uh, this notion of one size fits all. You have, you're diagnosed with, with cancer and the immediate tendency is to give uh, a chemotherapeutic agent, chemotherapy, which may kill the cancer, but will kill a lot of the healthy cells in your body as well, will be replaced by a far more individualized approach to cancer therapy. We will be at a point where Alzheimer's disease, we won't be talking about Alzheimer's disease impacting 50 million or 5 million. We will understand that disease much better and be able to tailor treatments to people with, with uh, specific uh, genetic defects. Similarly, an autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, and in cystic fibrosis, and many of the other rare diseases uh, which, for which there's no treatments available today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, if I may invite the uh, presenters to uh, join up, us up here at the table. Uh, we'll start with a brief Q&A. Um, just one, one question for each panelist that we've prepared, and then we'll open up um, the Q&A session to the audience here as well as the online audience. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much again. Uh, the, our first question is to Dr. McNally. Um, and briefly, could you comment on the key technological breakthroughs that would you anticipate would impact your area of interest the most in the next five to 10 years? But I have so many areas, so it's <laughs> hard. Um, I mean, I think most of us are, are truly excited about gene editing and CRISPR and the ability to change genomes. And so literally each month that goes by, sorry, let's just do it. Not very loud. Um, I was saying gene editing, I think, is the most important thing that we've seen happen in the recent years. Um, every month that goes by right now, we're seeing newer enzymes coming along and even engineered forms of the enzymes to do the gene editing. So to recognize CRISPR-Cas9, as described, actually comes out of a bacteria. And you know how many different kinds of bacteria there are? So we have a lot of different enzymes to be able to work with. That's why we're seeing new ones come along. So I think we'll see that get better and better, more precise, and really be able to, to make changes without some of the off-target concerns that we have now. Thank you. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9 is the winner here so far. <laughs> now, next question is to Dr. Shanley. Um, you've described many absolutely cutting-edge um, diagnostic innovations that, are, that, that may become relevant to clinical care in the near to medium term future. Uh, in your view, which of the novel diagnostics would impact how doctors make decisions about their patients' care in the next five years? And what role, if any, do you see the genetic tests that are marketed directly to consumers uh, would play in clinical care? Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer the second part first in terms of the commercial opportunities for uh, DNA sequencing. Um, I think that there, these are uh, low cost, low, um, low sensitivity testings that do give you some uh, broad view of maybe what some high-risk high risk genes may be. Um, they uh, certainly are a good driver for, uh, converse, for dinner conversations regarding your heritage, <laughs> which some people are surprised at when they get their 23andMe uh, genomes back. Uh, but I think mostly probably in terms of risk and risk estimation and potential 
preventative, preventative nature. So, I mean, I would see that if there were some high-risk cardiovascular, high-risk cancer genes that might be modifiable by your behavior, uh, that that might be something of value. Uh, the challenge of it is that there are not enough experts, genetic counselors, that can provide individuals the right interpretation of the data coming out of that. And so, and I wouldn't say that our academic medical centers are in much better shape. I think one of our major limitations is how we can help people distill, both the physician provider who may have ordered the test, as well as the patient and the family, how to interpret the test. That's a real challenge that we have in expanding and scaling much of our genomic precision medicine component of it. Um, in terms of technologies, I, I uh, you know, I would continue to say we, uh, I had, I've leapt from understanding gene expression, and I left genomic causes of those differential gene expressions behind for the time being, because I felt like it was important if we had discriminatory biomarker information that we needed in real time to affect our decision making, that would be the transformative step that we would need in terms of affecting care or designing studies better. So I don't know if LSPR and microfluidic design that, that uh, some of us are working on is the answer to that, but I certainly think more the technologies that are emerging, whether it's measuring proteins like we're aiming to do, or even measuring RNA species, which are the step right before the protein making, that the ability to get that information into clinicians' hands in near real time will be the most important transformative clinical component. That's enlightening. Thank you so much. Um, and our last question is to Dr. Salvin. Um, so today at present, one would say that oncology has really been the focus of trying to um, interpret and amass the most information um, and, and correlate uh, human genome and disease progression. So oncology has really been the focus to date. What um, are some of the other areas that are uh, non-oncological diseases that you see entering into focus over the next five years or so? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I, I think we still have huge unmet medical need in oncology. Uh, if you think about pancreatic cancer, for example, it's absolutely devastating. Most people do not survive a year. So genetics, genomics, a whole variety of approaches are needed to come up with more effective treatments for, for, for in, in the oncology space for a number of different, uh, different cancer types. As we look out, though, over the next 5, 10, 15 years, I think the application of a lot of, the, a lot of what we've talked about tonight to the brain uh, is needed and could be extremely illuminating in terms of coming up with more effective treatments, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but better understanding schizophrenia and many other affective disorders, I think could be greatly helped uh, by, the, by leveraging uh, omics technology, genetics gen and proteomics, metabolomics uh, much better. And uh, a third area is autoimmune disease, uh, where we've spent most of our time tonight, or nearly all of our time tonight, talking about human genomes. But there is another trillion genomes in our bodies called the microbiome, the bacteria that live healthily in our, in our, in our, in our guts primarily, uh, which far exceeds the human genome in terms of size. And uh, un better understanding that uh, could be very enabling to come up with more effective therapies for diseases like Crohn's disease or uh, other, auto, or, 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 other autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Uh, and now we'd like to open the, um, open the Q&A session up for um, questions from the audience here or if there's any online questions as well. Yes, and um, I'm asked to remind you that please use the microphone because the session is recorded. Uh, for Dr. Sullivan, <clears throat> the FDA has had very elaborate procedures for approving drugs, and for some of the things that you're talking about, try, uh, a drug that is going to be very effective on one-tenth of one percent of the population, 
Uh, how do you test it? How do you get an FDA to uh, approval process to do you, do, do, will the FDA have to change its procedures of approving drugs to make these things practical? The, uh, the FDA and other regulatory agencies across the globe have been changing their procedures to enable the incorporation of, you know, of the approaches we've talked about. And I would particularly note the, uh, you know, the acceleration of more transformational medicines in oncology for different cancer types in leukemia or some solid cancers, the, um, the advent of immunotherapies. The, uh, the FDA has been a very important partner in terms of helping catalyze regulatory science that's keeping up with basic science to drive that forward. Ultimately, it's going to, it's, it is going to require partnership between academic institutions, medical centers like Northwestern, biopharmaceutical companies like AbbVie, and the regulatory agents to fully you know, map out how does one get the most effective treatments to patients, even if it's a small patient population? You know, first and foremost, making sure that the, the drug is safe and then uh, is, is eliciting the efficacy. But there's definitely been a lot of progress in, in terms of uh, the regulatory science evolving uh, with the basic science. I had a question for Dr. Stanley. You uh, talked about some of the emerging technologies that are out there. I wonder if you would care to comment on what seems to be a very promising technology of biochips, where essentially uh, an individual's T cells are analyzed relative to the efficacy of drug treatment and the ability to actually improve precision medicine, and then maybe what might be the impact on not using animal models in the future as prevalent as we do today. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a, an extremely promising technology that is uh, being increasingly utilized. And you can, you can think about a number of ways to leverage that aspect of it. You can take the, the native cells from the bloodstream, the immune cells, and be able to uh, both uh, different, uh, understand their differential lineage and understand how they are functionally responding uh, through stimulation as well. Uh, you can also kind of engineer uh, the, the patients, as I was mentioning with iPS cells, you can engineer the patients organ specific cells to be able to do the experimentation on a biochip from that standpoint as well. So I think the, those kinds of technologies which allow the experimentation on the individual patient's lineage, if you will, cellular lineage is certainly something that's gonna be critical to, to the advancement. I would only question as well that even once you get FDA approval of a drug, how do you pay for it? You know, we, uh, we are now treating spinal muscular atrophy, not quite with genomic medicine, but an interesting RNA skipping drug. Um, SMA affects about 300 children a year in the US, and it's about a half a million dollars a year of drug cost. All right, we got a question online. Um, how accurate are the 23andMe tests, and are there more uh, a clinical setting where the similar testing could be done? Um, so 23andMe is, again, looking at about one one thousandth of the genome. It's not doing complete sequencing, and it's looking at that fraction of the genome that really doesn't look very much like the rest of the genome. Um, and in fact, some of the deep biobanks that have been built, it's really based on that same type of data. So the bigger the databases get, the more accurate they are. So they're very accurate at telling you things like, are there other people you're related to? Because looking at one one thousandth of the genome is, is good enough for that. That's actually gonna give you good information. And then there are a few, in 23andMe's case, there are a few rare variants that are also being tested. Um, for example, the most common um, gene change that causes cystic fibrosis is represented on there. So if, if you have very specific questions, there's a few things on there like that, but it's not the same as genetic testing. But um, 23andMe is, does have actually now some healthcare providers involved in their system, mostly genetic counselors, and so you can get that information, you can take that report, it's all done under the same regulatory approval, so you can bring that report to your doctor. Your doctor may not know exactly what to do with it, but, um, but you, you, you can consider the results valid 
if that's the question. Again, another online question. Is childhood cancer almost entirely caused by genetics versus environmental factors? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, I, I think as was alluded to, we, we have m many more questions still to answer than we, uh, than we know. Um, uh, and I do think that it is, a, it is both, the answer to both uh, questions. There are certainly uh, many cancers in which the underlying uh, genetic cause is, is really well defined. Um, and there are others where it, it appears that, um, in particular, radiation therapy, for example, or other environmental exposures to toxins are likely a common trigger uh, to then uh, turning on the machinery uh, of what we call oncogenesis or, or cancer-causing um, activities from that standpoint. Um, the, uh, I, I think that in, in pediatrics in particular, utilizing genome information in terms of the difference between what, what the genome of a tumor is and what we call the germ cell or unaffected cells in a child's body, we look at the differences between those two things in many cancers, and those differences often will then direct us to potential genes that are, are being turned on or turned off differentially in the cancer. And so um, I think the more, that we're, uh, the more we're asking that question, the more in almost every case we're identifying something genetically altered in the turn on of cancer. And the question, though, is whether that would happen de novo or it happens in response to environmental exposures. Uh, and, and I think we have much to learn there. And I, I, I will only say that we, we recently uh, did publish a, uh, a, a white paper uh, to the scientific audience uh, suggesting that we talk about omic medicine in terms of genome and transcriptome proteome. Uh, but we also called for similarly collecting a lot of environmental and socio-economic uh, data as another ohm. And so what people are exposed to dietary-wise that might affect their microbiome, what they're exposed to environmentally, uh, their, uh, what, what their socioeconomic status happens to be, because uh, we know there are disparities in cancer uh, related to, to disparities as well. So while we collect the information on the biologic ohms, we ought to think about the environmental and socio and socio ohms, and that's what maybe all of us will also begin to contribute some data towards. Great questions. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we'd like to invite one more question from the live audience, if we have one. And if we don't, then we'll go to one more question from our online audience, and then we'll wrap up with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, how is CRISPR different from zinc finger gene editing? <laughs> oh, it's, I am watching them too. Um, so zinc finger is um, was an earlier form. There were two earlier forms, talin and zinc finger, and they also do work. They're just much less effective than CRISPR-Cas9. So the fidelity of it and the efficiency of the process is much better with CRISPR-Cas9 than with zinc finger or talin. So it's you know a couple of order of magnitudes better. So. Oh. Let's thank our panelists for uh, dedicating their time to us. <laughs>